Welcome to the Startup Grind. Recently you wrote um, a great answer on Quora about what you think some of the top qualities of a great founder are. Yeah. And uh, of the founders that you've met over the years, can you talk a little bit about some of those points that, that yes. you mentioned and give some advice around them? Some of, so some of the things were uh, resilient. You know, so the guys who started age, um, Airbnb, it took a thousand days for that business to start working, not, not to become profitable and become successful, but to start working. So what if they had given up on day 999? And so one thing I've, I, I've on my wall uh, uh, a TechCrunch party poster that says, uh, I'm not delusional, I'm an entrepreneur, right? And if you're not so passionate about your idea that you're gonna go at least a thousand days without giving up, then don't, don't even try. Because it could take a thousand days for it to start working, right? And that doesn't mean you've made it and are a billionaire, but that just means it's, you know, it took a thousand days to figure out how to make the engine even turn over and start to work. Okay, so resilience. Um, vision, you know, there's a lot of great CEOs who are well-spoken and who are resilient and all that, but if you don't have a product that people want, nobody's gonna know your name, I think I wrote, right? So if, if you understand how to build a product that people want or don't even know they want, and then they see it and then they want it, right? Like Google Project Glass. <laughs> Nobody's going to question that Larry Page has vision because he bought the team that's doing self-driving cars and, and Google Project Glass. Now, whether those two things are profitable, that's another story, but, <laughs> but the great CEOs have a way of finding a product or building a product that people want. Uber, Airbnb, et cetera, et cetera, GoPro. Um, so that's that vision. You know, people have been arguing with me about integrity. I put it like lower you, you on the list. You said those were but, nice to have. <laughs> well, but I, I, I think said that's it was kind of high on the list. Though. Yeah, because I, I think we've met CEOs that haven't been, <laughs> haven't had integrity, but were successful. So I was like, mm, I, I'm arguing, is that a precondition? But I, I, several people have made arguments, and I would move it up the list if I redid the list today. Um, I, and the reason I put it on the list was uh, C, CEOs are survivors. And if you don't survive, you're not gonna be the Steve Jobs, right? And if you have something in your closet that comes out, like the guy who ran Yahoo, right? He got kicked out. Um, that, that, that was a lack of integrity, right? Um, if, you have, if you treat people differently in public than in private, that will probably come back and bite you. Now, a lot of people say, well, Steve Jobs was an asshole. Uh, and he was an asshole to me personally, right? And uh, in fact, uh, is Andy here? What, what, was your, what was your title at Apple? Fuck he was chop. on the first iPhone team. <laughs> fuck chop. Yeah, his title was fuck chop, given to him by Steve Jobs, yeah. right? But Steve Jobs had integrity because he behaved the same way in public as, a, as with Andy behind private, closed doors, right? This is what should happen. So, and integrity is an interesting word. It's, it means that you are what you appear to be, right? So, um, what's some of the other ones? Um, Ability to hire was my number one. I, you know, I've watched um, people who build businesses, build companies, and take an approach to building a company do really well. Um, and people who can't hire or can't fire when they make a mistake um, doom the business. I, I worked for a guy who was really great at hiring. He had, had all the social media experts in one building at one point, and he couldn't fire. He couldn't fire incompetent people. He should have fired me or another guy, because we were pulling the company in two different places, and he couldn't fire anybody, and it doomed the business. Mm. So the ability to convince somebody to join you when you don't have a big name, you know, you're not the Facebook, you're not the Google, you're not the Airbnb, you're some XYZ schmo startup. What's your startup, Dandy? <laughs> yeah. No name. We're gonna hear about it this afternoon. And so, you know, when you have a startup that nobody nobody's heard of it and people join you, that tells me that you're, you're along the road to being a good CEO. Um, and we could keep going. Okay, so let's, um, actually Mark Swister just gave a great talk about um, how important product is. Yep. And so I think that kind of goes back into what we were talking about, your Facebook phone, no, I'm just kidding. No, no, this is my <laughs> iPad, I, you know, this um, great product, right? <laughs> But like it, we, before we were talking about viral loops and triggers and how that that's important to PR and how important tying in product, 
viral loops, and then PR as a as one. I was like the 80th person on Instagram, and that, that's a great example. So Instagram didn't have a launch plan. They, they didn't say, we're going to hold this until South by Southwest and have a big party and send out press releases and stuff like this. I found out about it by accident. So nobody called me up and said, man, there's this cool thing you got to check out. No, I was at uh, Dog Patch Labs, which if you'd never been there, was a place on the pier. And I had a bunch of picnic tables, and there was a bunch of people trying to build companies there. And I was there for something else, and somebody said, hey, check out these two guys. They're building a, a cool photo app. And they, they instantly took my phone and put it on there. So one, anytime somebody asked, <laughs> you know, try to get your app on the phone and get them to try it, right? right. And that was their instinct was, yeah, try it out here. <laughs> and two, uh, there was less than 80 people on it. I went outside, took a picture, and in three minutes, I had uh, three or four comments. I said, oh, the addiction level on this is high because of those other 80 people, there are, there were other people waiting on the app for new photos and were commenting on it. And they were people I trusted, like Kevin Rose and MG Siegler and, and people like that. So that was another thing, you know, get the cool kids. But, so, yeah. but the product rocked from day one, and, and, the, and the product had this viral loop that I wanted to get other people on it so I could see more inbound photos. Because the more photos you saw inbound, the better this thing Got. So do you define product, viral loop as something that makes you want to share or that actually forces you to share? Both. Uh, you know, I, I used Waze on the way here, right? And I want everybody else to get on Waze because the more, pe more of you that get on Waze, the better the traffic app is, you know, for everybody. Um, I'm using uh, new email tools. I just signed up from Unroll, but I, I'm using SaneBox and the other inbox. I'm using Smart Labels, and I just met the Gmail team that does smart labels, it gets better the more people who use that feature. And the more people who take a spam email and put a spam email in the spam folder, the better the anti-spam features get, right? So the whole system gets better the more people who use it. And that's, so it, it's both, it, you know, sure. these things impel me to talk about them, but they also work so well out the gate that, that it's apparent that they work. You know? I think it's like talking about the difference between people thinking that PR is the answer for user growth and like when you when you do when you when you get press and then you have this huge spike in 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 users and versus growth hacking it's, right which is it, product it's an answer not the answer right. uh, the guy who started Atari Nolan Bushnell said it was the cheapest customer acquisition thing he ever did he said that that hiring a PR firm is uh, gets you customers cheaper than advertising on Google or throwing a party at South by Southwest or doing other things that you might try to acquire customers. So what do you think about hiring a PR firm? What would you say to uh, a, an early stage I, I would startup say, and when do they need it? I would say if you hire a good one, it, it really helps you get known and get out there. But like Instagram and Flipboard proved, you don't need one to if you have a great product and if you have great networks of people and instincts to know how to uh, get people to try your product and get it out there. I would say, by the way, I would spend uh, a lot of my time thinking about how to get Google and Amazon and Apple to feature you in the app stores now. You know, when I started blogging, blogging was how you got known. Now I would rather be in the, uh, number one on the Apple app store. Uh, Andy, how many people a day does the app store kick over? I think it's about 10,000 a day, right? Yeah. So if you get your app featured on Apple, that, that Apple alone gets you 10,000 people a day. Getting on TechCrunch, maybe a thousand, maybe you know. Yeah. And if it's a really, if it's a really sensational article, you know, three thousand. But it's hard to get higher than that from one TechCrunch article. Right. Now, if the entire TechCrunch staff goes crazy about you, yeah. and you're the app of the year, and and they talk about you like they did for, for Instagram over and over, then it turns in a, something bigger, but that's hard to do. That's really hard to do. I, I'm, you know, on Facebook, I have a list of 2,400 startups, and I watch the marketing outflow of those startups. It's really hard to get noticed in this, in this uh, world. So how does someone get noticed? How does someone 
for instance, when we were talking about seeding and getting the right people on your product early, yeah. how does someone get you on their product early? Um, one, I have in my head a battlefield, um, a, a theory of how the world is going to work. And that theory is evolving pretty quickly because I'm visiting so many companies. Yesterday I was at Plantronics that makes all, the, all sorts of audio uh, gadgets you know, for call centers and for people who want to talk in their cars and stuff. Um, you know, I visited Qualcomm and Oakley and Facebook and Google and on and on. So I, I'm starting to get, build a, a, a theory of how the world is going to work in the future. In fact, Andy and I were just talking about his talk this afternoon on the future of mobile, right? We're not letting you talk about mobile. And, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be sitting in the app, in the uh, audience to, to, to reevaluate my theory and see if, if what he's seeing, does it fit into my theory? So some things I'm, I'm seeing is the world's uh, amount of sensors are going up exponentially. The world's uh, wearable computers are get, going up exponentially. I have a new watch from Basis, right, that has four sensors on it. And soon I'll have Google Glass, which will have another six sensors. And I'll have a thing from Plantronics in my ear that has another six sensors. So the number of sensors is going up. The number of wearable computers is going up. The amount of data is going up. I'm, we're seeing that at Rackspace. The amount of data is just going crazy. Um, and that means there's new database technologies, new um, database computation technology, all sorts of stuff. So, so you can tell I'm starting to build a theory of how the world is going to work in the future right. by talking to Procter and Gamble and Ford and GM and, and Oakley and stuff like that. And so if you pitch me something that fits into that framework, yeah. uh, I like it. It feels good. If you pitch me something that doesn't fit in that framework, I don't like it. So, for instance, um, people have been pitching me stuff on laptops, and I was like, where's your mobile app? Because I'm noticing the world is mobile, right? How many people here have a mobile phone, right? And how many people here walk down the street like this? I watch how humans have changed their behavior. We have changed our behavior radically. How many people are carrying around tablets? I go and count the number of people on a tr plane, and how many iPads are there? How many Kindles are there? How many Android tablets are there? How many Microsoft Surface tablets are there? And that, all that informs where I'm going. Then I'm watching 33,000 people or 38,000 people on Twitter now, and they're feeding back like, hey, I just got a new Surface, uh, I, and I love it, or I hate it. Those little signals are telling me how this theory is working. And if you're pitching me something that doesn't fit into that theory, I, my flags go up. Because I, I assume that uh, early adopters, people who are likely to try something new, like an Uber or an Airbnb, are probably on one of these, or probably on a mobile phone. And they're probably not the guy like my dad who still is using a Dell laptop. Not, he does not adopt new things. He's very hard to convince to try something new. It took me two years of banging on my dad to get him to try Google, right? He did get on Google, so they, you know, that user is very important. But for a startup, a startup has to find a thousand passionate customers. And it's probably not going to be my dad. So at, what do you want to see beginning. the most of right now? Like, if, if, if these people had startups in this room, what, what, were you, what would you be really excited about? I'm, I'm seeing that the, the future of the world, every product is going to be personalized and is going to be uh, predictive. So Google Now uh, is, is a predictor of what's coming to, I think, almost every product. And I have several of the examples that I'm testing out on my iPhone right now that are coming out in the next month of things that are predictive, things that are contextual, things that are personalized, highly personalized, things that add value to my life. I talk to the Angry Bird guys and they're, they're thinking about this. How do you make a brand, a, a gaming brand, personalized and predictive and different than their competition, right? Because they have a thousand, I think the Angry Birds, he said, if you go to the app store and search on games, there's like a million competitors of Angry Birds. So they're always thinking about how to, how to do something different. Uh, Plantronics yesterday was talking about they're putting sensors in this thing so they can t sense when you pick it off the table. They have separate sensors that sense when you put it on your ear. They have another sensor that senses when you walk toward your computer. This is how products differentiate now. And, and so if you have sensors and wearable computers and big data and you're using social behavior in some way and you're using location behavior in some way, that stuff all makes me hot and bothered. And if you don't have any of those five things, I'm like, well, why not? And where do you think you're going to get your customers in the future? Okay, that's fair. I, I, like, I had to like pause and, and digest all of that. Um, 
So it, it, the trick is to have a story that fits into the marketplace, right? If you are already showing me a, a product for the Google Project Glass that's coming out later this year, and you're already uh, giving me uh, betas of it and showing me what you're thinking. So, so then you want to see that founders are thinking forward. Absolutely. I saw Siri, Siri, the two guys who started Siri came into my bedroom six months before <laughs> they launched it. Six really? months. Be, and that, and it was a, a forward-thinking product. When I see a forward-thinking product and I have time to digest it and try it, I'm more authoritative when I tell audiences this thing is fucking hot. And so many companies now are all about launching and not about building. This is about building a company, and it's a, it, it, most people just don't get that. Okay, I think that's good. How are we on time? Because I definitely want to make time for questions. I feel like people would have really good questions. Um, is there anything that you else wa want to say or like? No, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, how do you get into TechCrunch or into, into how do you get journalists to write about you? Um, a lot of it's about the story, you know. Do you have a unique story? Did did a 14-year-old write your product? Feature that. Did did a former iPhone team member write your product? Feature that, right? Did a PhD but what from if Stanford? You're, but what if you don't have any of that? What if? No, you're... you have to find a story that matters sure. to journalists. I, you know, tell a story. You know, and that's a number one. You're a CEO. Your job is to figure out the story. And if you don't have one, you make one up. eBay made one up. You know what the eBay story was? Uh, Pez dispensers, right? Somebody just nailed it. Pez dispensers. The, the, guy, uh, the story was that the guy liked collecting Pez dispensers and wanted to sell them by... Got it. Right. Lady, I'm sorry. Yeah. But, well, it was, yeah, it was Pierre, Pierre and, and, the, and uh, the other co-founder, the lady. Uh, I forget her name. Um, but I, I know the story. I don't even know the co-founder's name, right? right? The story matters. Having a story that you can go in and in one minute say, this is what it does. And if you can't say that in one minute, you're done. I, I interviewed Saeed, who runs Plug and Play. He said, and I was riding the elevator, I go, did you ever get an elevator pitch? He goes, yes, in this elevator I funded somebody with $384,000 in a one minute elevator ride. So if you're That's not willing, story. if you're not able to differentiate your company, your product, your, yourself in one minute and explain what makes you special to the world, you're, you're screwed. I think that's great advice. Um, I'd like to open it for questions. Does anyone have questions? Waze, W-A-Z-E for traffic. It's my favorite traffic app. I, I keep it up on the dashboard. It shows me where the cops are. Uh, it shows me where <laughs> It shows me where other drivers who are using it are, and it also, if, they're, if, if I'm stuck between, behind a huge wreck, I can take a picture of the wreck and put it up and tell everybody else in line, you're not going anywhere, so have fun, you know, <laughs> turn off your engine. Okay, who's got a question for Robert? Anybody else? Oh, um, come on, we need the first brave person. <laughs> On advice getting featured? on getting featured in the App Store. Um, yeah, so I, I used to know a, a, a guy on the team, and now I'm having to rebuild that relationship. So it's a relationship, partly, but it's also partly they're watching people, they're watching signalers for what is hot, what is interesting. They're also now doing, they review every single app. So they're looking for something that's cool, uh, clean, different, has a different user interaction, uh, and that is potentially uh, showable to their customers, because they're trying to show that they have apps that, app that Google and Amazon and Microsoft and RAM now don't have in their stores. So they're looking for things. So that's one thing, is a lot of these guys are playing games. If you give Apple an exclusive and you can go in there like Flipboard did and say, hey, we're going to be exclusive for a while, they're going to be more likely to meet with you and, and feature you. Um, and there's a whole little game there. That, that sort of is also why you have good advisors and why there's value to, like 500 Startups is going on a block away right now, why there's a value to being hooked into networks like that because somebody there does know somebody at Apple. <laughs> and, 
and can suggest your app to try to the right guy. Uh, I used to pass along apps when I saw them, or when I saw Siri, I, I sent that to the team and said, man, this thing is, is really something you guys need to check out. So, and they did go and check it out. Right? How approachable are you? My phone number's on the internet. It is my phone. It's not Google Voice. And my, my email's on the internet. The problem is uh, I have so much inbound now that your story has to be remarkable to get above the noise, to get me to have the ability to even answer you back. It helps if, if you have a referral, right? If Ron Conway writes me, believe me, I have him on a whitelist, and he goes into a separate folder on my email, and so if he says, Scoble, you gotta see this thing, it's cool, I'll listen, right? And same thing for Andy, and same thing for a lot of my friends. I am watching uh, 37,000 people on Twitter. Not every, not every minute, right now I'm not. And you have time. Facebook lists as well. I have Facebook lists of, in, of investors, executives, um, other journalists. So I watch a, a other journalists very heavily to see if there's signaling that I, I, I'm missing, you know. And I miss stuff, I, I haven't, uh, I miss Pinterest for a whole lot of reasons. Right? Why did you miss Pinterest? Not a woman. <laughs> right? And I didn't really miss it, but it wasn't for who, who I am. I'm looking for uh, something um, that has high, high technology to it. Um, and to me, it looked like, oh, okay, this is Instagram like for your refrigerator door. And I missed it for that whole In other words, I, my biases are weird. And I have them. Every journalist has biases. And that's why you need a PR team who knows who each journalist is and who to pitch. You know, and what, and what kind like. of expected reaction you're going to hear, right? If you're pitching a rim phone to MG Siegler, you should know that he is pretty heavily in the Apple camp and that he's going to be pretty harsh on you. Now, that might be good to go and visit him, right? In fact, rim came and visited me because I'm the same way, and I think they went and visited MG. It's good to reach the people who are against you because if you can convince them that has real power to sure. the marketplace. If you only talk to your fanboys, you're going to be stuck with 2% market share, right? If you can convince the Apple fans to come over and say this thing is really awesome, then you can change markets, right? But, um, but you should at least know going in the meeting that this guy is, going to, is against us, probably is going to be anti us for the first 15 minutes of the conversation and very skeptical of anything we say to him. If you know that, you can convince them in a different way. You, you would talk with them in a different way. And um, that's why you hire a PR firm. If you don't know who people are and you don't have these networks and you haven't spent 80 hours a week studying journalists on yeah. Twitter and Facebook and going to parties and going you to go conferences to like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's several a week, right? And in fact, Peter is Peter Mullet. No, Peter is in the next room. Peter, oh, you're here. Oh, he's a professional party goer. He has a great email list of all the parties and events that you should go to. Serious events, not parties. Serious events. Is that events. what we call them now? Serious, Serious events, events with alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Serious events, OK. Um, all right, let's, um, anyone else have any burning questions? Yeah. Do you ever look at press releases? Um, press releases. Yes, I have a whole folder of them. I, I use... <laughs> Not in the I, inbox. In fact, um, I just switched my email, because I, I was sitting on the plane back from France. I was sitting next to a, a guy who runs the Gmail Smart Labels t team. And if you haven't turned on Smart Labels, you're stupid. Uh, go into Gmail Settings, Labs, and look for Smart Labels, turn it on. It'll, it'll clean out your inbox pretty dramatically. But the... Uh, so I, I had 1,600 filters that I had written for Gmail, and last week I turned them all off. And now I'm using Smart Labels and Other Inbox and Sane, SaneBox, so three filtering tools. And I'm teaching them who is sending me press releases. So all the press releases automatically go into a folder. I have never found a good company through a press release. Uh, it's no not that they don't, the good companies don't do them. It's just, I've never been pitched through a press release about a brilliant company. Uh, Siri didn't come that way. Uh, uh, Flipboard didn't come that way. You know, n nothing good comes that way. I, it's almost always somebody in the hallway going, holy shit, look at this cool new app that I just got on my phone. 
that I'm not allowed to say anything about, you know. And in fact, I have a couple on my phone that I'm itching to tell everybody about, but I can't. Um, but that's, that's, that's the way, you, you know, or personal recommendations, where an investor calls me up and goes, okay, I finally have a great company that you need to meet, and you need to meet this team. And the investor often will tell me a story that these guys are four PhDs from Stanford and they're just unbelievable, or they're uh, four guys for, who started Pinterest and they all defected and left and started a new thing. I mean, that's how I found um, Gumroad, right? From uh, the 17-year-old who... Sahil, yeah. Sahil, you know, and, and on and on. So it, again, it comes back to story, referrals, signaling. If, it, you know, if I miss it, it, does everybody talk about it? Like Twitter Vine, I wasn't briefed on Twitter Vine. But I watch Twitter. I wasn't briefed on Twitter. No, because I, you know, I don't <laughs> I get invited to Twitter anymore, right? <laughs> I'm not friends of Biz and Evs anymore. So, so um, they have bigger things. They have the Pope, you know. <laughs> if they're going to make a call this morning, it's going to be to the Pope's PR guy. You know? Hey, can you tweet out another thing that a billion people might <laughs> react to? You know? um, but within a few minutes of that release, I saw the signaling of, of how people were reacting to it and saw that it was going to be a significant new thing that came out of Twitter. Okay. All right. I Anybody think, else? Yeah. I think we're, uh, I think Go we're to Andy's talk. Up. He actually knows what he's talking about. Yeah, he Andy, actually built Andy's the, talk this afternoon. He built the first iPhone, so, yeah. or he was on the team of it. Uh, how many people built the first iPhone? Forty people built the iPhone. So small teams, big impacts. Awesome. Thank you so yep. much for being here. We appreciate it. And uh, we we look forward to seeing what you have coming next. Yeah, the book's with out in with September. With your book in September? Yep. Great.